Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful morning, isn't it? Amen. Um, we're going to continue. Well, I hope we're continuing with our testifying. Joan, are we continuing with our testifying? Okay. Joan snuck in this morning. I didn't even see her. And so we started singing, and I'm looking all around the room for Joan, and I can't find her. And uh, when I came up to, to greet you all, I don't you? Oh, but I didn't ask if she remembered that she was giving her testimony. So God took care of everything. God knows what's going on, even when his servants don't. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Joan and let her share with us what she wants. Just a little bit of old. some things of two journeys that I've been on in my life. My life journey began when I was born in Detroit, the second of three girls. And um, shortly after I was born, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, my parents lost their home in Detroit, and so we moved to the country outside of Detroit. I lived there until I was married in 1963, and we moved to a small farm in northern Michigan where our two children were born. We sold that farm in 1978 and moved to Stevensville, and we've been here ever since. My husband died in 1994. I retired from teaching in 95, and from a very lucrative job at Kmart. <laughs> <laughs> My spiritual journey began before I was born. It began when my mother stood at her mother's graveside and realized there had to be something more to life than what she knew at that time. She knew that death was, could not be the end of this life. And so she began her search for this something else, and she found it was not something else, but someone else, and she became a Christian. Because of her conversion, I was raised in the church. And so from little up, you know, I knew all the songs, I knew all the Bible stories. Um, when I got older, I knew all the wonderful hymns of the church. I memorized scripture by chapters, not by verses, but by chapters. And because it was uh, a rather legalized church, uh, I dressed properly and I spoke the right words, and I did the right places, and I did all the right things. And I thought I was fine. I knew God as the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, the Lord of the universe. But it wasn't until my early teen years that I began to realize that, that was not enough for my life either. And so I accepted him as the Lord and Savior of my life. And when I did that, I found out that something else came along with it. I thought maybe, you know, like Richard said with this little button doll, all of a sudden, boom, you're a Christian and that's fine. It didn't work that way. I found uh, that there were things that needed to change in my life. Uh, I think Bob Benson, in a, in a poem that he wrote, uh, expresses what happened next in my life better than I can. He calls this little poem Digging. God and I raised a flower garden. Well, he really did most of the work, I guess, because we used his soil and his air and his water and his life and his sun. My part seemed so trivial that I said, Lord, you take these bulbs and you make them grow right here in this box out in the garage. You don't need me, Lord. You can do it by yourself. No, he said, I want to do my part. I'm waiting to begin, but you must do yours too. You have to dig the bed, bury the bulbs, pull the weeds. Okay, I said. So I did my feeble part, and God took those bulbs and burst them with light. He fed them with soil, showered them with rain, blew them with sunshine, until we had beautiful flowers. And then, he seemed to say to me, your life is like a garden. And if you like, we'll make a new <coughs> evening. I'll furnish the soil of grace, the sunshine of love, the rains of blessing, the wonder of life, but you must do the digging. Lord, you just go ahead. Make me what you want me to be. 
Make me a saint. Fill me with compassion. Give me great faith. No, he said, you've got to keep your heart tilled. Hold the weeds of evil. Chop away the second best. I'll make you anything. Pure, clean, noble, useful. Anything you want to be, but only if you dig. And so I found out that I had accepted not only Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I was given the Holy Spirit as, as the um, identifier of the weeds in my life. And so as I, as I look back on my life in this last, this last week since Glenn asked me to do this, I began to realize all the people that God has put in my life to help me in this process of reading my garden. First there was my mother, of course. Then there was the pastor of that little church I was telling you about that faithfully for years until, until his death would bring the word to us on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night. And there was the young couple in that church that would give up two Saturday evenings a month to take our youth group, which consisted of my sister and I, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, downtown Detroit to Youth for Christ rallies. And it was at those rallies that both my sister and myself found the board. Mm -hmm. Then there was my high school science teacher who gave up his lunch hour to sponsor our Bible club. There was the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship staff members who for years worked on the liberal campus to uphold a Christian presence in the, on that campus. And there have been pastors, there have been choir directors, Sunday school teachers. And everywhere I moved and everywhere, every job I had, God always provided fellow Christians for me to fellowship with. And now here I am and I had you folks to fellowship with. I was reading in Isaiah a couple years ago and came across the promise that God gave Israel. And as I read it, uh, you know, some of his promises were conditional. If you do this, then I'll do this. If you don't do this, then you're going to be disciplined. But this promise was not conditional. It was just no strings attached. It's a promise from God that says, I have done this, and I will do this. And as I was reading it, I thought, you know, he's talking about my life, my journey. And this is it. It's in the 46th chapter of Isaiah. And it says, I have carried you since you were born. I have taken care of you from your birth. Even when you are old, I will be the same. Even when your hair has turned gray, I will take care of you. I made you and will take care of you. I will carry you and save you. And he has done just that for you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you sang in choir? <laughs> week as I'm preparing for the message, I go back to each particular message and, and, and I 
fine tune them and I brush them up. And, and at the beginning of the week, I looked at what I had for this week and it was just perfectly clear where I was going and what I was doing. Then long about Friday morning, my perfectly clear is like the old TVs, you know, with the antennas, it's like my antenna went off somewhere. And it all got staticky and blurry and, and even yesterday. And I told Gracie, I said, I need to work on my message some more. I said, I need to, need to kind of get it, get it together. And last night she said, so did you get your message together? I said, nope. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure if it's because I'm just into fight, indecisive, or if God is really kind of moving me in a different direction. So you guys can pray for me that I'm hearing exactly what he wants me to hear, and I'm saying exactly what he wants me to say. Okay. Um, so we are in Colossians 3, and I'm going to read the first few verses of Colossians 3, um, probably about 11. I don't know that we'll get all 11 done today, but I want to read them so we keep the context. So Colossians 3, verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked, when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, before we get into this, you know, we, we have to remember, God did not write his word in chapters and verses. When, when he inspired Paul to write this, Paul didn't go, okay, I'm going to write a letter to the Colossians. I think I'll start with chapter 1, verse 1. Paul didn't think about that. He just wrote it down. We, we put reference points in there, so when I'm referencing the scripture, you know where I'm at, and you can get there. Okay, it's for our benefit. It's, it's to ease the sharing of scripture, okay? So, there was really no chapter 3 break when Paul wrote this. So we need to back up and kind of understand how Paul got to where he is, okay? And that's, that's messages that we've done previously. I'm just going to back up a little bit and I want to read what Paul said before. Starting in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, okay, so that, that all this is under, all this that we're saying is predicated under the understanding that you have died with Christ. Okay, you have to know that point for any of the rest of this to make sense. Okay, because if you haven't died with Christ, this doesn't apply to you. It, it, you it, he's not talking to you. Okay? Um, you know, when I tell one of my children, go do this, and another child says, hey, Dad told you, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to them. Let me handle it. Okay? Because, you know, children being children, when they're not the ones getting the blame, they're the ones in authority. Okay? <laughs> Just like we are. Okay? So, if with Christ you died, if, if with Christ you died, pay attention, because this is for you. Okay? To the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you have been raised with Christ... Now, see, this is why I don't like where the chapter break is. Because, see, earlier in 2, Paul is, is predicating this, if you die. He's continuing the same thought. This is the alternative here. This is what happened after you died. If then you have been raised with Christ, because it doesn't end at your death. That's really the beginning. Okay? So if you died, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Okay, do you see the contrast here? 
Previously, in chapter 2, he's talking about the earthly things, the earthly understanding, the earthly appreciation, the earthly intelligence, which really is kind of like an oxymoron. <laughs> okay? So, you die to the elemental spirits of the world with its teachings and its thinkings and all of those things, then you are raised in Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, He's not asking you to walk around like this. What are you doing? I'm seeking the things that are above. Okay? Now, we, we assume that because there's more that comes. But really, some of us, that's all we ever get. We, we, we kind of stop here. You know, we don't carry on. What does this mean? Seeking the things that are above. Well, he doesn't just leave us there. He, whenever God presents a question, He gives us an answer. Whenever He gives us a directive, He gives us the means to fulfill that directive. Right? It says, seeking the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Okay? How do we do this? Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, keep in mind, this is not just a random statement. What on earth things is He talking about? Back up to chapter 2. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. The human precepts, the human teachings, the human wisdom. That without God is not wisdom, it's foolishness. Okay? We have to understand that without God, we're at a loss. You know? Um, have you ever been invited to play a game that you didn't know how to play, you didn't know the rules? Mm -hmm. I hate that. You never know if they're pulling one over on you. <laughs> you know? Oh, you can't do that. Why not? You just did. Well, no, that's because it only works on every alternative Tuesday. <laughs> and if you have hair down the center of your head. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think you're pulling... No, it's in the rules. Go look up oil. I got oil. And that game's not even in the book. Okay? Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. It's a contrast, okay? For you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. Now, this is something exciting, okay? This is one of the scriptures why I believe in eternal security, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I believe there are a lot of people in church today that are going to fall away. Don't believe they're Christians. I believe they have the form of godliness, but they deny its power. Okay? Because understanding that this statement is predicated on if you have died and if you have been raised in Christ, if those things have happened, He has hidden you in God. He has hidden you in God. Do you understand how exciting that is? You are sheltered in the shadows of the wing of the Almighty. What can harm you? What can come against you? What can oppose you? That's exciting stuff. Predicated on, did you die? Are you raised again? Okay? So, for, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, okay, there we go again. When Christ who is your life appears, look, you have no life in and of yourself. If you do not know Jesus Christ, all you are is dead man walking. You're death on legs. Okay? You have no life in and of yourself. You have a, an illusory life. It looks like it, but it is not. If you have died in Christ, He becomes your life. I no longer live, Christ lives in me. Okay? This is a problem. This is a huge problem. Because dead men have no rights. Dead men have no rights. In all the funerals that I've ever been to, I have never seen a single corpse complain about being first in line. I've never seen a single corpse complain about what political party was in office. 
I've never seen a corpse complain about anything. They don't usually do much of anything at all. <coughs> okay? We need to understand that our life, if we are in Christ, our life is His. He will do as He wills with it. We accept what He gives us. We glory in what He gives us. Um, we have a book, that, it, there's actually a copy over there, it's called The Heavenly Man. And he makes a statement in there that I, that I wrote. And I know several other people have, have made it. I don't know if it's original to him or original to someone else. But when asked um, how, to, how they pray, he said, we do not pray that God would deliver us from hardship, from torment, from persecution. We don't ask that he would deliver us from those things. We ask him to give us the strength to endure. I think about that often. If you do any reading in the news, you might have to dig a little bit, depending on what news you're reading. But the church across the globe is under attack. Okay? We're offended here because our government says, okay, homosexual marriage is allowed. Oh, we're being persecuted! We have no clue what persecution is. We don't have any clue what persecution is. Okay? It shames me to even think that we would consider that persecution. Because we have people that are being beaten, that are being starved, that are being killed because of their faith and their refusal to deny that faith. They don't accept anything but the cross. The life that he gave them, that he is living through them, that's it. You cannot take that away. What do you do with someone like that? We want to be victorious in the world today. We have to have that understanding. That they can't take away what he's given us. They can't take it away. It's sealed for eternity. It's hidden with him in eternity. It will be revealed. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, for you have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Check this out. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. You will appear with Him in glory. Now, i got to tell you, I get increasingly frustrated with the jaded outlook of Americans. Myself included. Okay? To be honest with you, myself predominant. I tend not to be an overly excitable person. Okay? Um, I remember Benjamin telling me at one point, and he's not in here so I can say this, <laughs> that it was his goal in life to make me laugh. <laughs> you know what? A lot of times what I feel in here never makes it to here. Something broke. Okay? You know, it went from like a 10-inch pipe to a 2-inch pipe, and it doesn't really get up here very often. Okay? But it frustrates me when I can read something like, we will appear with Him in glory, and I'm not phased. Because, see, that's what this is all about. See, it's not about just getting us to the cross. The cross is the doorway through which we inherit eternal life. We inherit a relationship, an intimate, close, personal relationship with the almighty creator of the universe who loves us. Who longs to be in relationship with us. And we go, oh yeah. And he is coming back someday to take those who are his home. And He will gather them together in glory. And we go, yeah, yeah. But hopefully it's after Duck Dynasty. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see the problem? Mm -hmm. Our hearts are hard and calloused. And we're jaded because we don't appreciate the fullness of what he's done and what he's doing and what will be done in time to come. 
We've got calluses thick on our hearts. When we forsake the opportunity to worship God for titillating entertainment, which is of no lasting value, when I am willing to take time away from spending with my sovereign creator and play a doodad game because I don't want to be bothered. We have to have clear vision. We have to understand when I read this, when Christ who is your life appears, you will also appear with Him in glory. And we have to look forward to that with excitement and anticipation. Not with humdrum. Ho hum. See, the church in America is losing members left and right because we have nothing to offer except snobbery and judgmentalism. What in the world is the value of coming to church? Tell me honestly, what is the value of coming to church if this is not the point? To set up and, and guard each other with a bunch of rules and regulations? What are the rules and regulations for? What do we seek to accomplish? That somehow we can dress ourselves up enough Spiffy ourselves up enough to impress God when He's done all the work necessary for us to be perfect and blameless. And we lay out a bunch of rules and regulations. How many of you ever went to any kind of a youth function or a church function where your pants had to be a certain length? I spent six years in a Bible college. <laughs> Everything had to be right. Really? Did that impress God at all? Got a, ooh. I like that tie. Really? Because we're applying so hard to the external. Now look. Last week we talked about the personal sin, the universal sin. We're talking about the, the in, in chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, what brings us to where we are today. The human understanding of how to approach and impress God, we call that religion. Okay? As if somehow I have the means whereby to enter into His grace of my own power. Okay? You, we have to understand that it has no effect. If it did, there would be no need for the cross. None. And Jesus' life was in vain. His death was pointless. And we, above all men, are fools. Okay? But look at this. We're going to go on. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Well, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't you just say it wasn't about rules and regulations? What direction are these instructions coming from? See, it's all about direction. It's all about direction. The owner's manual. I can do all kinds of goofy things to my car in the hopes that it'll run better. But a flame paint job doesn't make my car go any faster. But if I fail to do what the designers of the car told me to do, the car won't run at all. The car requires gas. The car requires oil and some other things that I take it to the shop to have them do because I don't know what it is. And they got all things, doodads hanging on the wall and in racks and stuff, and they go, okay, yeah, we'll have it in so many hours. And I leave. And I come back, and I hope that they did what they said they're going to do, because that's what the designer intended for the car to function properly. It's direction. 
Okay? Chapter 2, we're talking about our attempts to get there. Chapter 3, we're talking about his direction to make life work here. Okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion. What's wrong with passion? What's wrong with passion? Misdirects our affections. Yeah. Passion about what? Have you ever known someone to be really passionate about a sports team? Do you ever know, you, you want me to, you know something that I found that goes hand in glove with passion oftentimes? Maybe it's just me. I understand I'm unique. Weird. Okay. Hand in glove with passion is oftentimes anger. Okay. This does not bring about the righteous life that God requires. Are you ruled by your passion or are you ruled by his truth? Because passion will lie to us in the moment. Passion will tell us in the moment, it's okay. It's okay. Truth is the same all the time. Amen. Truth doesn't change. It's concrete. Passion, that ebbs and flows. Sometimes it goes up. Sometimes it goes down. It will betray you. It will betray you. Okay? Okay? Evil desire. What is an evil desire? Well, anything that's outside of God's will for you. Anything that is not holy can be evil. That probably is evil. And covetousness. What is covetousness? Can somebody give me a working definition of covetousness? Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a one word term that should sum it up pretty quick. Americanism. <laughs> Needing just a little bit more. Not being content with what you have, but wanting a little bit more. Covetousness. Ooh, I gotta have that one. Well, you have this one. How many of you watch Veggie Tales? Okay? King George and the rubber duck. <laughs> but you have a whole cabinet full of rubber ducks. But not that ducky. We are a covetous nation. We want everything. And we want it now. After we finish Colossians, we're actually doing a series on money. Did you know that that is one of the top five things, and depending on how you interpret scriptures, it's actually one of the top three things talked about in God's Word? Money. But what do we ever hear about money? Oh, you've got to give in church. You've got to give to the church. But, but do you realize how small of a portion of scripture that addresses money actually addresses that? <clears throat> We're going to be talking about money. And giving to the church is only going to be a very small part of it because it's only a very small percentage of the scriptures. But one of the things that we are going to talk about is God has a plan for how you deal with money. Do you know that? Do you know God didn't forget about that whole thing when he put his word together? He didn't just miss that subject. He put a lot in here about it. But one of the things that we talk about that we're going to address is I want it now. <clears throat> that's covetousness you always want more and you gotta have it now I think one of the greatest I don't want to say evil but I think in some cases that evil is actually an appropriate word of the modern day is a credit card where you can walk in and have absolutely no money in your bank and slap that down and get what you want and walk out. You're using somebody else's money. Having been there and done that, that is a deep, dark, ugly hole to try and climb out of. Okay? Because whoever you make your master, you are slave to. 
And if your credit is what drives your life, I've got to work to pay off this bill, I've got to work to pay off this credit, I've got to da 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 you, you have taken on a new master. Okay? Covetousness. I've got to have it. And in America, I've got to have it now. Which is idolatry. Ouch. You realize that's idol worship? You're not worshiping the God of eternity. You're worshiping the instant gratification. Now, check this next sentence out because this is where things get scary. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God. See, those in Christ, those who are hidden in Christ, look forward to the coming of the Messiah, the second coming, the return of our Lord. But we should also have great pause because... I believe in Zechariah actually says it is going to be a fearful thing. Actually, in another place it says, why do you look forward to this day? Because it's going to be a great and terrible day. Because when he comes, all that is unpaid for will be called to account. All that is unpaid for will be called to account. Everything. And the only marker that you have in your favor is the blood of his son. Nothing that you've done in your life is going to impress God in light of the sin that separates you from Him. So what? You're going to get a better seat in hell? You got a balcony seat? Really? Separation eternally from the Almighty God. To come into His presence, to acknowledge Him, because it says every knee will bow. You will acknowledge him. You are Lord. I, I understand it. You are Lord. There is no other. And then to be cast out. And his wrath is going to be poured out. Now his wrath is going to be poured out twice. You understand that? Because it's going to be poured out on the earth. And in a bunch of different ways. But then the final judgment. The, his wrath will be fulfilled. And the separation of the sheep and the goats. And then it's done. So, because of these things, God is angry. <laughs> because of these things, God is upset. God is ticked off. And for a time, He is restraining His wrath. Why is God restraining His wrath? That the full measure may be brought in. That's the only reason. That all who would be saved would be saved. That's it. That's the only reason. And when that day comes, the bell goes off, the trumpet sounds. All that are gathered, that will be gathered, are gathered. His wrath will come. Because of these things. Covetousness. Evil desires. In these two you once walked when you were living in them. I'm not even going to go there. But now you must put them all away. Now, quite honestly, when I looked at these two lists, the first one, I thought I had a pretty good handle on. Understanding that I don't understand God's view of these things, God's definition of these things. I have a very limited scope. Okay? And then I get to the second list and God corrected my misapprehension rather abruptly. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Thank you, God, that you are bringing about the changes in me that you desire and it's not dependent on my ability to do it. Because if it were dependent on my ability to do them, I'm in trouble. We get out. I thank you very much for reading that poem. Because we get out and we dig the field. But which of us of our own power can make anything grow? Nothing. You can't. 
You know? You think you can? Roger, how many of us can grow one of your bulbs holding them in our hand with our sheer brain power? <laughs> our charismatic. <laughs> you get the opportunity, uh, spring and early summer, to look at Roger's flower beds. He's got beautiful flower beds. But we can't, we can't make those things grow. All we can do is be in submission to the direction that God has given that best makes the environment best for them to grow, and God takes care of them. Okay? Anger, wrath, malice, slander. Now, let's get some working definitions here. By anger, we know that this is not righteous anger. Because quite honestly, I, I don't think Paul even had to put that in there because we so very rarely understand what righteous anger is. Okay? Anger. James says that anger does not bring about the righteous life that God requires. How often we get angry with people for things. Even in our understanding of righteous anger. Do we understand that it's not the person that we're struggling and contending with? Who do we struggle and contend with? Principalities and powers, authorities, wickedness in high places. And you struggle with the enemy. Okay? You can go out, pick an enemy, and wail all you want on his sword. And you will never defeat the enemy. If you're spending all your time wailing on the enemy's weapons, on the enemy's tools, you're going to be defeated. Because the enemy's going to laugh because he's got a whole bunch of other ones. Our struggle is not against the people. Our struggle is against the one that has deceived them and blinded them. Wrath. Wrath kind of is, is an interesting thing. Can, can anybody kind of explain to me what the difference between wrath and anger is? Because I have a, a, an idea in my head, but can somebody explain to me why he says there's these two? Outpouring of your anger. Okay. Anger plus. <laughs> okay? There's a lot of things in life that make me angry. <clears throat> says rage. Rage, yeah. yeah. Well, let's see. That, that's actually an even more interesting way. Because, see, I think anger is the sustained. Rage is the sustained. Wrath is the sustained anger that you keep feeding, that you nourish, that you help to grow, that you don't let die down. I think it's also rooted in unforgiveness. It's a, it's a burden you take upon yourself. And any time that there's a, a move toward forgiveness, toward a softening, you harden it back up and feed it a little bit more. You go back and relive it so you can refresh your anger. Malice. Slander. Okay, so I'm going to leave malice for a little bit. Slander. Bad-mouthing people. We are all guilty of it. We, we like to dress it up and camouflage it as um, something other than it is. But we all have this weird thing in us that we want to tear other people down so we can feel better about ourselves. Okay? It is not for naught that Proverbs says, shut up. Even a fool is considered wise. He keeps his mouth shut. You want people to think you got something up here? Keep this closed. And obscene talk from your mouth. Now, obscene talk. Now, this is kind of a unique phrase. Because obscene talk to us would be cussing. But that's not really what this is talking about, although that's part of it. What this is really referring to, obscene talk is crudity. Okay? It's, it's not the F word. It's telling jokes about inappropriate things. It's having been called to a level of conversation here and dwelling at a level of conversation here. Okay? To take joy in debased talk, conversation. We have to be careful of this, especially 
in the workplace because it's so easy for us to slide into this. It's like chutes and ladders. Okay? God is calling us to come up the ladder to clean talk. And the world brings us down the chute and it's a lot quicker. And it's a lot easier to do. And all of a sudden a word will slip in. And then two words will slip in. And your conversation, instead of talking about things that bring glory to God and edify His body, begin to extol the things of this earth. Then he goes on, he says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Even little white ones. How do we even get colors for lies? <laughs> why, is, why is a white one okay? I mean, that, did anybody even think about that? That makes no sense at all. Sin is colorblind. White, black, purple, puce. I don't, I don't even know what color that is. But if you tell a few lie, it's still a lie. Okay? Don't do it. There is no good lie. Oh, 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 wait, wait. What about Rahab? She sent him off in another direction. She lied. She said, oh yeah, they went um, that way. What about her? God used the donkey to talk. God can use sin to fulfill his purposes. Was that the best way? No. I don't think it was. But God used her where she was at to accomplish his purposes. So I would guess that was a pew slide. <laughs> Seeing that you have put off the old self. Now, do you understand the phrase here? This is past tense. It is something that has already happened. Okay? We put it off. Quit dragging that dead corpse around with you. We have been resurrected to, do, to new life. Don't go back to the graveyard and dig up your old person and drag him around with you. He stinks. The stench is overwhelming. Oftentimes, people will never get to see the beautiful aroma of Christ in you because of the stench of the old you that you're dragging around. Past tense. We have put it off, so don't do these things anymore. And we have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. How do you get to know the creator? How do you get to know him? It says we are being renewed... In knowledge. Well, Romans 12 tells us. What? Come on, 12. That's right. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Now, do you understand the difference between conformed and transformed? Conformed is like molded and bent and reshaped. Transformed is like you took away the old and made it new. Okay. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our minds are one of the greatest battlefields that we will ever have in our lives. I got some ugly wars going on in my mind. Daily. Some of them I'm not even aware. It's, it's like the sniper in my brain. I'm not even aware it's there. It's a boom. There's another category. Renewed in knowledge. Now, let's go back to Romans 12, 2. It says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then what? Then you will be able to... We'll be able to know God's will. Do you understand you can know God's will? Do you understand how exciting that is? You want to know Him. You have to be renewed in your mind. You have to let go of the dead brain and take on the living, refreshed, revived, vibrant brain to know the will of God. 
Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all. We, we got so much racial bigotry in America. It, it's so frustrating to me. Everybody. Everybody. Oh, gee, for fun. You know, the Trayvon Martin, Zimmerman thing, nobody wanted that thing. Nobody wanted it. A young man lost his life. Doesn't matter. The bullet didn't care what color he was. He's dead. The man that survived lost his life. Okay. He may be living, he may be walking, but he has no life to speak of anymore. No life to speak of anymore. Okay. That, that teenage baseball player from Australia that was shot in the back by the, the black boys, the bullet didn't care what color he was. Okay. But I get so tired of crime being something other than crime. Look, why do you think Lady Justice is blind? Why does she have the bandage around her eyes. Because she does not see the color. She does not see the class. She does not see the creed. She judges justly. Was a crime committed? I don't care if you're purple. Was a crime committed? I don't care if you're puce. Was a crime committed? Okay? I get so frustrated with it. And what frustrates me even more is when Christians get on board with it. We are called to be colorblind, ethnic blind, okay? Because really, there's only two divisions that are of any consequence in this life. Those who he calls his own and those that are not. And for those that he calls his own, our job is to go out and witness and testify to those that are not. That's the only difference of any consequence. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what nation they came from. I, I don't care. Because I can't find any separation in here. Let's read that verse again. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, puce, yellow, orange, Muslim. Well, actually there is, because see, that is a problem. Because where is the here that he's referring to? Yeah. It's those that are in Christ. Remember, let's, let's back up. If you have been raised with Christ, that's what started this whole thing off here. And I actually back it up a little bit further. If you died with Christ, that's what started this whole section off. Okay. So the, the, the ethnicity is irrelevant, inconsequential. Okay. <coughs> One separation that we need to pay attention to, that we have to be aware of, is are they his, are they not his? Amen?